right, so for this audio lecture, we're going to be looking at T-cell mediated immunity. So um, first we'll be looking at how do T-cells become activated? What does activation mean? And then what are the different types of subsets of T-cells that you can generate during, due to the activation of them? So in order to get antigen to present to T-cells, you need innate cells like dendritic cells to take up antigen. Um, and then it is going to traffic to secondary lymphatic tissues like the draining lymph node. Um, draining lymph nodes are going to be located throughout the tissue and they're going to drain certain regions of the body. Um, and so in that way, the T cell knows when it comes in contact with an antigen presenting cell or a dendritic cell um, in a certain draining lymph node, they're going to go into the bloodstream and it's going, the bloodstream is going to take them to the site where the infection is occurring. So that's kind of like a big overview. What you're seeing here in this figure is that we have an area where we have an infection occurring. The dendritic cell is going to end up taking up some of that bacteria through the process of phagocytosis and processing it and then bringing it back to the lymph node. So you can see how that dendritic cell traffics to the lymph node. Um, it is going to be able to interact with the T cell areas, the T cell zones, where the T cell will be found. Um, just be aware that there are resident dendritic cells like, and also resident macrophages. So in the skin, we have these resident dendritic cells. They're known as Langerhans cells. So um, again, just be aware that um, if we're talking about something like the lung, there's going to be resident dendritic and macrophages that are present so that we always have surveillance and quick response so that if there is some kind of infection or damaged tissue, they're taking that up and then bringing it back to the lymph node to kind of report back and say, hey, does anybody recognize this? Does anybody have a T cell receptor that recognizes this? So here we can see um, how the dendritic cell changes as it matures. Um, so you can see that on the top row, we've got dendritic cells that are in the peripheral tissue. Um, you'll notice that you know, they don't <laughs> express high amounts of MHC class two, but as the dendritic cells are in um, lymphatic circulation, you can see that green amount is increasing, but what you'll notice is that there's a large amount of red, which is the lysosomal protein. So you need lysosomal proteins to degrade what it has undergone phagocytosis with. And after that has happened, ever after the degradation of the proteins, of the frag into fragments, there's a large uptick of um, increase of expression of MHC class two as shown in the bottom um, panel. So here we can see in that bottom panel when we've got dendritic cells, um, they are teeming with MHC class two. Um, they are gonna be loading that with fragments from what they have processed, which would come from that site of infection in our example, like in the foot, where we have some pathogen introduced, right? And all that can be presented to T cells because T cells have T cell receptors that could interact with MHC class two, you know, if they're expressing um, CD4, right? So CD4 is gonna interact with MHC class two. Now, dendritic cells have several pathways that they can process and present. So it's not just through MHC class two. So you'll see in this figure, the first two examples here are MHC class two. So they're gonna to present to CD4 T cells. So that first one is gonna be that receptor mediated endocytosis or phagocytosis of bacteria um, where it gets processed and presented. The other way is that it's going to take up macrophages that have taken up material. So if a macrophage has taken up material and then they've um, induced death, um, so when they take up material, they induce death. If you remember that back from our, God, that was <laughs> unit two, um, back when we were talking about innate, um, macrophages are gonna induce death and then the dendritic cells can take that up and then process the macrophage. This process is known as macropinocytosis. So macrocyte, macro, macrocytes, um, and pinocytosis, kind of drinking of that liquid, that fluid. So these aren't intact live cells. They've undergone, they've activated um, apoptosis and died and then been taken up. And then again, you can see how it's going to load MAC class 2, present to CD2, CD4 T cells, sorry. 
And then when we're looking at presentation to CD8, that's gonna be through MHC class one. So if the dendritic cell becomes virally infected, it's going to produce viral proteins um, as a kind of survival mechanism. It's gonna take those, survival, those viral proteins and degrade them through the proteasome. And that gets put on MHC class one and then moved to the surface where it can interact with CD8 positive T cells. We can also have a process called cross presentation. So if you have um, viral antigens that are outside exogenous, it can take that, those viral proteins up, degrade them through the proteasome and then um, load them onto MHC class one. So you can see there's like two ways that MHC class twos can be loaded um, in two ways which MHC class one are loaded or where the original source is coming from. And keep in mind, MHC class two is going to present to CD4s and MHC class one are going to present to CD8 T cells. So on the other side, we've got how do these T cells come in interaction with the dendritic cell, right? So we have our naive T cells. They're going to be coming in through our, um, into the lymph nodes. So you can see them entering there through the, the, e, the HEV. Um, they're going to be interacting with the dendritic cells. So you can see these dendritic cells. Um, if we have a dendritic cell that is bearing antigen, which is shown by the red, um, if those T cells recognize and see that, then they become activated. And again, we'll talk about what that process means. So we can see how these T cells go from green being naive to blue. Now they're mature, the T cells are maturing, they're becoming activated. You'll notice that if they don't engage, so we have this dendritic cell that doesn't have any antigen, it's engaging with a green naive um, T cell. Uh, it doesn't see any antigen, it can go back into circulation and come back through. Um, so you can see how it's gonna leave through the efferent lymph, um, lymphatic vesicle. Now there's two different ways that these naive T cells can enter in the lymph node. Um, so they can either directly enter in through the bloodstream. So again, you can see here, they're entering through the bloodstream, entering through the HEV, interacting with dendritic cells, and then leaving through the efferent lymphatic vesicle. And they would go to where that, drain, where that goes to, where it drains to. The other way is that it can go into another lymph node. These lymph nodes are all connected through the lymph system. And so root two would be indirectly entering into a lymph node, okay? So you can see here how we have our draining lymph node where we could directly, naive T cells can directly enter into that, or they can go further upstream and go to an upstream lymph node, but then they could leave through what would be the efferent vesicle of the upstream lymph node becomes the afferent vesicle <laughs> of the draining lymph node where we actually have pathogen, where we actually have antigen present, okay? Um, we'll go over that in class because it's a little bit easier to kind of like point that out and annotate it. So one of the things that happens during an infection is that there's gonna be changes of surface molecules both on um, endothelial cells that are lining um, the, ven the lymph node, but also on this naive T cell. So what we're seeing here in this figure is some of that, those changes of attaching adhesion molecules that are gonna allow for adhesion to each other, um, attracting of each other. So you can notice that we have a chemokine in our second panel, that chemokine is going to draw that naive T cell into that endothelial layer. And then it's gonna allow for attachment of these um, glycam-1 and CD34 um, interactions. That's gonna allow for additional chemotaxis um, where you have the chemokine binding to receptors. Um, LIF-1 is gonna um, be activated and that's gonna allow for then that a naive T cell to squeeze through those endothelial layers and into the lymph nodes. And keep in mind there's transient adhesion. Um, so we wanna get the naive T cell in and then we 
want to allow it to then adhere to the dendritic cell. So you're going to see on the dendritic cell, we're going to express ICAM1, which is an adhesion molecule that's going to bind to LFA1, LIF1. Um, and so again, those interactions are going to kind of begin, initiate the docking, if you will, the binding of the T cell to the dendritic cell so that we can then get interaction between the MHC class two and the T cell receptor and CD40 co-receptor. If that's a CD8 or CD4 T cell, if it's a CD8 T cell, then those interactions would lead to class one um, interaction with CD8 being the co-receptor. So when we're looking at actually activating this naive T cell, we, um, the T cell needs what's known as two signals. It's really three signals, but it's always referred to as a two signal hypothesis. So it needs the signals between the MHC class two, if we're talking about CD4, so the MHC, the T cell receptor, and the co-receptor. So you can see here where we've got the signal one, we have those interactions between MHC class two, the T cell receptor, and CD4. And then those ITAM domains become activated. So that's one signal. The second signal is by co-stimulatory molecules. And the co-stimulatory molecules you're seeing here are CD, um, CD28 on the T cell side. And then on the dendritic cell, the ligand that's gonna bind that is B6, okay, or B7, sorry, B7, I was thinking of the most. Um, so B7. And so the, that is known as the co-stimulatory signal. So again, you have to have the T cell receptor, co-receptor MHC signal, that's signal one. Signal two is gonna be your co-stimulatory signal. And this co-stimulatory signal can be different. So it can be inhibitory, so it'll actually stop the response, or it can be excitatory and lead to response. The third signal that you need is cytokines, okay? So signal one and signal two actually are not enough to generate activation of the T cell, you still need signal three, and we'll look at that in just a little bit. But these first two signals end up making up the immunological synapse. So think about like a synapse um, where like a neuromuscular junction, um, similar to what we're having here, where we're having interactions between two immune cells, our dendritic cell, or what really is an antigen presenting cell, and with our naive T cell. And so some of this is gonna be coming from the dendritic antigen presenting side, and some of this is coming from the T cell side. And so you can see some of those molecules that are present on those different size, sides. But again, it's going to be this complex that's formed in the synapse is made up of the T cell receptor, which is going to be our antigen receptor, co-receptors, co-stimulatory receptors. Okay, and there's going to be receptors and ligands that need to interact with each other in order for the synapse, for the signal to get sent to the T cell so that it generates a response or it activates, it matures. So what happens is these um, complexes cluster together so that they're likely to interact with each other. Um, and so we find these associated with lipid rafts. So if you think back to cell bio, you would have talked about lipid rafts on the cell membrane, and this allows for cell singling events because it allows for receptors and co-receptors to come together. One great example of that is in immunology right here when we're looking at this immunological synapse. So again, it, all these pieces have to come together so we can get these cell singling events occurring. And what's shown in your textbook is on the left side, and it's just showing those cell signaling events that are going to occur when we have activation of signal one and signal two. So again, antigen receptor, co-receptor, signal one, signal two being co-receptor, um, co-stimulatory receptors. And so that's gonna cause phosphorylation events. I don't expect you to memorize this, but one of the big things you should probably know and keep in mind is NF-kappa B is one of the common transcription factors that's looked at. So that if you're looking to see if a pathway is being activated, you would look to see whether NF-kappa B gets phosphorylated and if it translocates into the nucleus, because when it translocates in the nucleus, it's gonna to lead to gene activation. 
and those gene activations going to lead to a response or activation of the cell. So that can be proliferation, that can be production of cytokines, whatever the effector function is. Really what we're talking about here is activation of cell signaling pathways, right? So again, I'm not expecting you to memorize all of the intermediate cellular um, signaling molecules, but you should definitely, you know, be able to, if you were shown this, be able to kind of talk through it or something along those lines. One of the things that can happen is that you, when this T cell becomes activated, it changes the expression of the IL-2 receptor. So remember we talked about IL-2 receptor during development of the T cell that increases, so it can sense, respond to interleukin-2 um, being one of the cytokines that can be present. And so when the T cell becomes activated, it actually produces a different form of that receptor that is a higher affinity. So it's gonna to bind to IL-2 better. So even if there's low amounts of IL-2, it'll be able to sense that and then generate a response from it. And the reason for that is that when we have IL-2 present, it signals for the T cell to proliferate and also differentiate into a different, different effector functions. Um, so if you had T cells in culture, one of the things you can do is feed them IL-2 and that actually induces them to proliferate. Um, in a biological system, you need to have your IL-2 receptor, but you also have to have the antigen present, okay? Um, and this really is speaking to the third signal, right? So if we don't have you know, recognition of antigen, if we don't have co-stimulatory, if we don't have production of cytokines, the T cell is gonna become energic, where it's not gonna proliferate, it's not gonna differentiate, it's not gonna respond, it's not gonna produce cytokines, um, and it's gonna be, again, what we call energic, where it doesn't respond. So for CD4s, there are a number of different subsets that we can have, um, so we can, divide them into these five different groups. So we have um, Th1, Th2, Th17, TFH, which sort of stands for follicular, and T regulatory cells. So these cells would have a T cell receptor and CD4 as a co-receptor. But what they're, what, um, what's different about them is the cytokines that induce them so given the cytokine environment that this T cell becomes activated in, it's gonna change what subset it is, okay? So you can see if interferon gamma is present, you're gonna get a Th1 profile. So that's the subset you would actually end up inducing. Now, if you then go down and look at the um, transcription factor, you'll notice the transcription factor is different. So it uses T beta. So if we were trying to determine what kind of subset of T cell we have, we could, or of CD4 T cell we have, we could look at the transcription factor that is being induced. And you guys know from our journal club paper, um, they looked at like GAT3 um, in figure th three, which we haven't gotten to yet, but hopefully we'll get to this unit, um, FOXP3. So again, the, the transcription factor can tell us a little bit about what subset we have. And we can also look at the cytokines they're producing. So you can see that Th1 are gonna produce IL-2 and interferon gamma, right? Where if we look at like T regulatory cells, TGF beta and IL-10, right? Um, if we look at Th2, IL-4 and IL-5, right? So if we did an ELISA, we could look at the cytokines being produced to indicate what subsets we have present. And then lastly, there's the function, right? So what are these cells actually going to do is very different, right? So when we're looking at a Th1 um, CD4 positive T cell, it's going to help to activate macrophages because if macrophages are activated, this can generate an immune response. If we look at Th2 cells, these activate cellular and antibody response to parasites. So these would help B cells in order to generate a response where Th17 cells are going to enhance neutrophil response. So they're good at helping and activating neutrophils. Um, T follicular cells are gonna interact with B cells in the follicle region of lymph nodes and secondary lymphatic organs. And so they are known for interacting with B cells. 
Um, and so, and hence refining the, B, the antibody response. And then T regulatory cells actually suppress all of these T cells. So it makes it so that they don't do their job. Um, and I always liken um, T regulatory cells as nannies. So they kind of keep the kids in line. <laughs> and so they kind of keep the other T cells in line. So keep in mind that each of these have positive feedback loops based on the cytokine environment they have that can polarize them to a different effector function in which is needed, right? So if you have parasitic worms um, present, so you have these parasites present, you naturally have a response and a presence of IL-4, which tells that the T cells, okay, we need more of these T cells to respond so that we can then produce antibodies against them and such. So again, um, the that cytokine environment is really critical um, to inducing the right, the quote unquote right subset. Now, when we look at C, um, CD8 T cells, there's two different ways those can be activated. So in interacting with dendritic cells, um, they can interact with a dendritic cell that's presenting um, viral virus derived peptides. And so these viral derived peptides are going to be presented on MHC class one. So the CD8 T cell is going to interact with that with its T cell receptor and also the um, co-receptor CD8, right? So signal one, and then it's going to have signal two of co-simulatory molecules. So C um, you see CD28 and B7 interacting. Okay, that's going to lead to a response directly from that CD8 T cell. The other way that they can be activated is that because a CD4 T cell is interacting with the dendritic cell, that CD4 T cell ends up activating that CD8 T cell. So here you can see the CD4 T cell on the right side starts to produce IL-2 um, cytokine. That's gonna be able to give the third signal to that CD8 T cell so that it can become activated. In the previous example, or the on the left side, the CD8 T cell needed to produce the IL-2 itself, and that doesn't always happen, right? So it doesn't always get that third signal, so those CD8 T cells wouldn't activate. So to ensure the activation, we that CD4 T cell there provides the help by producing the cytokine for it. So it's gonna be more likely for the CD8 pos positive T cell to become activated. And CD8 T cells are viewed as cytotoxic T cells, um, just to put that in there. <laughs> so just like uh, we've seen with other um, cells during development, even when we're talking about T cells during their development, during activation, there's going to be changes in expression of surface molecules. So here you can see that between naive T cells and effector T cells, there's going to be changes of expression of certain molecules. One of those molecules that you'll see is VLA4 um, gets upregulated in effector cells, but also things like LIF1, CD2, and CD44. So these are important for the effector cell to be able to provide its function. And then as we've already mentioned, um, co-stimulatory signals are required for the activation of these naive T cells. So if they do not receive the signal to the co-stimulatory signal, they're not gonna become activated, okay? Um, So looking at the effector function of cytotoxic T cells, um, which are CD8, and also helper CD4 T cells, um, this, we can look at different molecules that these cells are gonna produce. Um, so there's gonna be certain um, cytokines that they're gonna produce. And then when we're looking at the cytotoxic T cells, the CD8 positive T cells, there's gonna be certain cytotoxins. Um, cytotoxins are toxins that actually um, kill those cells. So a lot of times those are going to be virally infected cells. And so we want to be able to kill, we want to be able to punch holes in them. Um, so you can see porphyrin, gramzyme, 
Um, those are common cytotoxins that are looked at. So again, we've seen in our journal club papers where they've looked at um, porphyrin, they've looked at gramzyme um, production to indicate that they have C a CD8 or a cytotoxic population. But we could also look at the cytokines. Um, again, some, you'll know some of these cytokines overlap where other ones are pretty unique to those cells. And that's why a lot of times you'll see cells, cell populations are gonna be gated. Um, so you're gonna know that you're looking at CD8 positive cells. So then the next question becomes, okay, well, what cytokine are they positive for? So that's why you'll see those, you know, on your, um, your X and your Y axes, um, looking at um, cell sorting data. So I won't go through all these, but def um, definitely make sure that you're looking at the effector function. Some of these we'll talk about more so, especially the helper cells, because when we talk about B cells and their activation, you'll hear some of these CD4 T cells again, like TH2 and like T follicular cells. And then, um, you know, potentially when we're looking at our... Um, Last unit, when we're doing miscellaneous topics, we might be talking about mast cells or xenophils, um, some of those disease um, illnesses that arise. Um, so again, those might come back. So for this figure, I included this figure in because I just want you to be aware of the JAK-STAT pathway because it's a common pathway that's looked at um, for immune cells, looking at to see whether there's activation. So you're gonna have cytokine receptors, um, and they're going to be binding Jack. Jack becomes phosphorylated. That causes STAT um, to become phosphorylated. And then that leads to translocation of transcription factors and turning genes on, right? So um, again, just be aware that um, just like NF-kappa B is a common um, transcription factor that's looked at, the Jack stat pathway is a common pathway that's looked at for immune cells because it it is um, activated through cytokines and their receptors when they bind. And then so for this figure, they are looking at the CD8 um, positive T cells. And this gives you a really nice image of how um, CD8 positive T cells actually kill. So on our left side of this figure, this is just your cartoon kind of drawing of what's going on. And then on the right panels, um, this has immunofluorescence where they've stained with fluorescent dyes and the green is for microtubules and then the red is for lytic granules. So this would be like the porphyrin, right? So these are the um, cytotoxins. And so one of the things you'll notice is that early on when we're just starting to have adhesion to the target cell, so we've got CAMs that are interacting with the T cell in the target cell, so we have adhesion going on. So we're gonna have some changes to the microtubules, um, but one of the things you'll notice is that the lytic uh, granules are kind of diffuse across there, but very quickly, we're gonna start to redistribute those, um, the cytoskeleton, and then you'll notice that the lytic granules are actually clustering together, so they start to aggregate together, and then we're gonna get release. So there's gonna be a recognition that this is the target cell by the T cell, and then that leads to the release of these toxins, which then leads to the target cell being killed because we're gonna, these cytotoxins basically punch holes in that cell, the target cell's membrane, and causes whatever's inside to leak out. And cells don't like that, they end up going into apoptosis and dying. And so again, you can see here um, how first we're gonna have recognition um, by the CD8 positive T cell through the peptide that's being presented in MHC class one. So remember all of your cells, except for your red blood cells, have the ability to present MH on MHC class one. So if they're virally infected, they're going to present. CD8 T cells interact with them. This is gonna lead, these interactions lead to cell singling events in that target cell to go into apoptosis. Plus you're adding in that CD8 positive T cell being able to produce um, cytotoxins and releasing that, that's gonna induce death. And then it's gonna move on to the next cell, right? So there's always this, okay, move on to the next cell. It has the peptide, 
and because it's been virally infected. So there's going to be this, you know, secession of kill a cell, kill a cell, kill a cell, right? Um, and it's just going to keep repeating that until either it's lived its life um, or there are no virally infected cells. Um, again, here you can see this interaction between the cytotoxic T cell and the target cell. The target cell is stained in blue. And then you can see the microtubule, the act, or the actin, it says actin tubule, um, where it is rearranging. Um, and then you also notice the lytic granules that are moving over towards that, the interactions between the blue and the green. Um, and again, you would end up having that target cell killed. Now, Th1 CD4 T cells can activate macrophages so that the macrophages can go and kill microbes. Um, so they become highly microcidal. So microcidal microorganisms, microbes, cidal, kill. And so um, through the interactions of the CD, uh, Th1 CD4 positive T cell, and with the macrophages, so you can see how we have interactions between our MHC, class 2, our T cell receptor, our co-receptor is CD4. And then we have interactions between CD40 ligand, so C CD40L, which you guys saw again in your journal club paper, interacting with CD40. So CD40 can be found on B cells, but also can be found on the macrophages. So these interactions act as our co-stimulatory or you can think of those as being co-stimulatory. We're going to get productions of cytokines like interferon gamma. Um, your macrophage is going to have receptors for interferon gamma, and that interferon gamma is going to cause that bacteria to be able to effectively kill bacteria. So it is going to go out there and start undergoing phagocytosis and killing bacteria. Now for your... T follicular cells, um, they're going to activate naive B cells. So here we see our T follicular cell. Um, it is going to be able to provide the signals in the cytokine production for the B cell so that it can become, it can mature and become activated. And again, we'll talk more about this um, when we talk about B cells for chapter nine and B cell activation. But again, you can see how we have MHC class two. It's got peptide loaded. And so T cell interact, the T cell receptors interacting with that. We have our co-receptor CD4. We have co-stimulatory. So we have CD40 ligand and CD40 interactions. So just like in the macrophages. And then we have cytokines. So just like T cells need three signals to become activated. So remember, this is an activated T cell. B cells are also going to need three signals. Again, we'll talk about more about this in our <laughs> next chapter. But again, you can see how we get our three signals. So this is going to activate the B cell. Now, it's important to note that, um, that the interaction that's happening on this MH, MHC class 2 and with, um, with the T cell receptor, this antigen is going to be the same as what the B cell recognizes on its B cell receptor but the epitope can be different, right? So keep in mind over on this left side, you have that B cell receptor taking up antigen, right? So antigen is the whole molecule. It's gonna internalize that and process that. So it's gonna, because keep in mind, a B cell receptor can see intact antigen. It recognizes, it interacts with an epitope, but it could be the whole entire molecule that it's bringing in. So it's going to process that and then load that onto MHC class 2. So then that gets presented. So you can see here how it's the green side. I think that's green or is that blue? Um, <laughs> the non-red side is what the B cell receptor is interacting with. But because it's being cut down and processed and put on MHC class 2, it's only the red portion that's actually in the T cells interacting with. So the T cell needs to be able to recognize that and needs to have a receptor for it. But if it does, so if it sees the same antigen, but it might be a different epitope, B cell can still become activated. 
And then we have our T regulatory cells. Again, these would be CD4 positive, but they are gonna produce cytokines that actually suppress other immune cells, um, especially having a function on the CD4 population. So again, think of all these other CD4s, they are very activating, right? They're like encouraging, they're egging on <laughs> these other immune cells to do, their, to do their job. Come on, macrophages, go kill these bacteria kill these microbes come on b cells activate produce uh antibodies right well t regulatory cells basically are telling these uh, tell these other cells through production of like il10 hey no 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 no! don't don't do that it's, you're doing you're misbehaving um calm down so they stop them from overreacting or getting overexcited producing too much cytokine so they quell the response they quiet the response so T regulatory cells, if we talk about autoimmunity in our last unit, we will talk about T regulatory cells because they're really critical and they, we actually see that there's decreased amounts of T regulatory cells in autoimmune individuals. Um, and so it's believed that's one of the reasons why peripheral tolerance goes awry because you have these T cells, CD4 positive T cells with effector functions that are activating that are not told to calm down, right? Um, so <laughs> it's all a balance. And again, I always think of T regulatory cells as nannies because, you know, if the kids are at the playground and they're running up the slide and they're supposed to be going down the slide, the nannies are yelling at them and saying, no, 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 don't do that. Or maybe the parents are, but um, <laughs> I always think nannies have more control of kids. I included this slide just to provide you of an overview. It's from a different textbook, but I think it's very helpful in thinking about um, the whole process of T cells becoming activated. And again, keeping in mind, um, this is a very dynamic process. It's not that the T cells staying in one location, just saying like, oh, who's gonna interact with me? They're moving around also. And it's in the lymph node where the interaction with the antigen presenting cell or the dendritic cell that is now presenting antigen um, is going to occur um, to activate the cell, whether it's a CD4 positive T cell or whether it's a CD8 positive T cell. These cells need to have three signals, right? In order to become activated, that cytokine signal is really important, that third signal. That's gonna cause proliferation, a cause factor function. So you're gonna see subdivisions of that. One of the things this textbook doesn't um, go into terribly is the memory population, um, but memory T cells are really critical, both of the CD4 and the CD8. Um, co-receptors okay um, like always if you have any questions please you know get in touch with me um, the other kind of companion audio lecture to this is b cell activation and that will get posted shortly so thank you very much